Okay, let's open with prayer. Dear Lord God, we are thankful for this day, a new day, a day of your blessings, um, your guidance, your presence with us. We are aware of many of our friends at church and outside of church that are facing difficult health issues, and we just ask your presence and healing touch on their uh, bodies. We know that around the globe there are conflict areas where people are just being devastated, and we pray that somehow that uh, the peace that is spoken of in our passage today would come to them your peace and grace and your presence be with them in these times. As we look at your word, guide us, um, fill us with um, the the joy that is here and the, um, the challenge that lies before us. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, let me uh, do a couple of things here. I want to read the passage. We're in chapter uh, 10 of Luke. Uh, verses 1 to 12, and then I want to make uh, some just general comments about the text itself, and then I want to make a few comments uh, by way of summary. So that's the plan, and then we'll hopefully have a chance to chat um, at the end. So let's read this, Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 12. After these things, the Lord designated or appointed uh, 72, some translations say 70, but we'll ask that in a minute, 72, and he sent them uh, two by two before his face um, to every town or city uh, and place of which he was about to go. And he... Uh, was saying to them, on the one hand, the harvest is really big, it's great, um, but the workers are very few. Uh, therefore, petition the Lord of the harvest so that uh, he might cast out or send out workers into his harvest. Depart. Behold, I am sending you as lambs in the midst of wolves. Uh, do not bear or, or carry um, a, a coin bag or a knapsack uh, or sandals. Um, and uh, do not greet anyone uh, on the way. In whatever house you might enter, first say peace to this uh, house. And if uh, there might be a son of peace there, uh, your peace will uh, rest upon it. But uh, if indeed not, um, your peace will uh, come back to you. Now, uh, in this house remain eating and drinking uh, the things uh, of them, that is the, the provisions of them. For the reason you do that is because the worker is the worker is worthy of um, his uh, wages or his reward. Um, do not flit, do not go or depart from house to house. And in whatever city you enter and they receive you, uh, eat the things uh, presented to you and uh, heal those in it uh, sick and say to them, the kingdom of God has come near uh, right upon you, uh, right there. Um, but uh, in whatever city you enter or town you enter and it does not receive you, uh, when you go out into the streets of it, say, even the dust which is clinged to us from your streets, or from your street, from your city, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, it, it's cling to our feet, uh, we wipe off uh, against you. 
Um, however, know this, that the kingdom, the reign of God uh, has come near. I say to you that, that Sodom, uh, for Sodom in that day, that is in the day of judgment, it will be uh, more tolerable than for that city. Okay, so that's the text. Uh, then let's uh, look at it a minute uh, by way of comment. Let me just make uh, a few comments about uh, this particular passage. First of all, I would summarize the passage in, in this way. I would say, first of all, what we see is the Lord's work. And then secondly, what we see um, is the, the disciples' uh, response or the disciples' work, I would say. And then at the end, we see the beginning, and we'll probably hold this until uh, next Tuesday, but uh, we see the beginning of uh, what we will call judgment or the judgment that comes to people um, in the ministry of Jesus. So what's the Lord's work? The Lord's work, first of all, is to appoint, secondly, to send, thirdly, to instruct. So, uh, in this particular text, it tells us that the Lord appointed 70 or 72 uh, people to send out his, some of his disciples. Now, this is a big entourage that is moving with Jesus uh, from Galilee to Jerusalem, to the Judea area. And here we have a, a textual variant. Now, uh, let me just back up and say, in in the New Testament, uh, in the modern New Testament, the Greek New Testament, we have um, over 5,000 manuscripts or fragments of manuscripts uh, or uh, translations of the early text that scholars are working with. 5,000, over 5,000. So any text in the scripture has various textual variants, that is, uh, textual readings from the West, um, Rome, and so forth, or from the Alexandrian um, uh, tradition. And so there are, there, there are many uh, options that, the, that you see uh, scribes have either changed or accidentally forgotten or missed, they, their, their eye skips a line or such thing. Uh, or even some corrections. Some of this is in the, in the margins, and then later scribes will put it into the text and so forth. So here we have that. This is not a, a, a significant issue. So in that way, I think it's easier to look at. Are there 70 or are there 72 people that are being sent out by Jesus? Um, by the way, it'd be interesting to, to show... Uh, hands. Let me do this just so I can see. Um, how many of your texts have 70? Yeah, raise your hand if your text has 70. Okay, uh, number. How many have 72? Okay, if you... Okay, so, um, so if you're in a Bible study and you're talking with each other, uh, whose text are you going to agree with, right? <laughs> And and it becomes, I mean, most of the variants are uh, non-substantive, um, but sometimes they are substantive. This one, it seems to me, uh, is I would say it's non-substantive. But how do we how do we determine what is the text that we should follow? And um, in this particular case, we have a tradition that goes back to the Hebrew Bible. And in the Masoretic text, uh, the Hebrew text of the, of the Hebrew Bible, our Old Testament, there's strong evidence for the number 70. Uh, there's 70 offspring of Jacob in Genesis 46. There's 70 elders and sons and priests. There's 70 years, um, for, sometimes for important events, or even 70 days that Egypt uh, mourned uh, and wept for Joseph when he died. Uh, Moses chose 70 people to, um, to help him 
distribute the the ministry, the the work that he was called to do. And maybe even more important, in Genesis 10, in the Hebrew Bible, uh, Hebrew text, there are 70 nations. Okay, that's pretty strong evidence. And the actual external evidence, other than those kind of things, the the evidence, the manuscript evidence, is pretty evenly divided between 70 and 72. So what do we have in 72? Well, uh, if you look at the Septuagint, which is the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which Luke is using in all of his quotations from the Old Testament, Luke uses the Septuagint, um, you have 72 nations. Um, In Numbers 31, you have 70 cattle that are separated uh, for sacrifice. Um, in Third Enoch, which is uh, not in the Old Testament, but it's one of the um, uh, Hebrew writings, uh, you have 72 as the number of princes and the number of languages that there are um, in, um, in the world. And uh, you have 72 translators of Hebrew into Greek. So, I would suggest that the better reading, even though most of you don't have it, the better reading is 72. Partly from the standpoint that it's a little bit of a harder read and it's a shorter read. And it also is from the Septuagint, which Luke is using. And so very likely 72 uh, is the... um, uh, the better reading of this particular text. Now, I would say in either case, it begins to give us the symbolic uh, importance of the mission that is going to happen um, that we see in Acts uh, to the whole world, uh, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Um, In either case, uh, the number... uh, gives us a sense that what Jesus is doing now is for all the people. Okay, I think that's the theological understanding of this, as opposed to the um, uh, the way it is uh, put out uh, in terms of the actual number itself. So one of the things that Jesus does is he appoints people. You are part of those who are appointed. And he sends everyone, or he sends to every town, every city, it's polis, actually, every city that he is going to. Um, And it it follows the the tradition that is already set up. John the Baptist was uh, called to prepare the way of the Lord. Uh, James and John were sent out to prepare uh, uh, the way for the Lord. And now these 70 are going out before his face to proclaim the gospel, and prepare the way for Jesus to all the cities that he is going to come to. Now, whether he will come to all 36 communities within, because they go two by two, within that amount of time, we don't know. But um, very likely, it's meant to tell us that he's going everywhere to everybody uh, on his journey to Jerusalem. But he's taking people and preparing people and sending people who are, as uh, Joel Green says, full participants in the divine mission. Now, this is also, it seems to me, something that Luke is trying to tell his readership. Not only that there were 70 or 72 that Jesus sent out, but that, that the work of Jesus is sending out and that those who are reading this text are part of those, uh, those who are following Jesus on the way, symbolically or literally, are part of the divine mission. You are part of the divine mission. Um, What you have to do is an integral part of what God is doing in the world today. And I think that's what this um, preparation, uh, this sending, Uh, is all about. And we'll see how important that is next time when we see the judgment and then the judgment on Satan itself, not himself. And then what Jesus does, not only does Jesus um, appoint or designate people to go out, 
not only does he then send them, actually send them out, but he also instructs them on how to do this. And here, it's really interesting that I would say there, there are three things that, that the disciple is to do. That is the work of the disciple. One is to pray. Two is to adopt a self-understanding that Jesus has them uh, gives to them. And three, then, is to obey the instructions. So pray for more workers because the harvest is ready. And, you know, it seems to me that that is always true. The harvest is always ready. People always are ready to hear about peace. People are always ready to hear about the goodness of God and the grace of God. Uh, people are, now, they may not want to hear our story of that. But there's a yearning, it seems to me. I mean, today, I think the world is yearning for the cessation of hostilities and and getting back to, I'm not sure it's normal, but getting back to uh, civility with one another, whether they're in a war-torn area like in the Mideast right now, or whether we're thinking of our own political um, situation, um, there's something unsettling about that. And if somebody was coming and was bringing peace and bringing uh, the cessation of hostilities, but also the well-being, the, the full um, embodiment of God's desire for people, that would be a great thing to hear about. So pray for workers of the har for the harvest. Adopt a self-understanding uh, that Jesus gives to us. The self-understanding is you are lambs, vulnerable, defenseless lambs in the midst, sending and going out in the midst of wolves. Um, and notice that Jesus does not adopt the violence uh, and the destruction, the destructive behavior that his disciples wanted him to use. Listen, if they don't agree with us, if they don't receive us, then let's just destroy them. No, Jesus says, no, you're lambs. You are uh, vulnerable, defenseless people that are going out in the midst of those who can eat you up. Now, we'll, let's, we'll come back to that too, because I'm not... I don't really like that kind of terminology. I mean, I don't mind being called a lamb, but to call the society in which we live wolves, um, that's a little more problematic. We'll come back to that. And then we're to obey the instruction. Now, the instructions uh, then are what not to take and what to take. Don't take the normal things you would take for a, a travel, for um, uh, going on a journey. So don't take money, that is a coin bag. Don't take a knapsack, that is a backpack. Don't take sandals. Um, and by the way, don't greet people on the way. Partly because the greetings tended to be extended greetings and there's an urgency about the, the the need to get to those places to prepare the way for the Lord and uh, to give them uh, the good news of the of uh, the kingdom of God. So no greetings on the way. That seems counterintuitive to what Jesus is talking about, but no greetings on the way, partly because of the urgency and the priority of getting to that place where you're going to prepare Jesus' way. But it also intends us to be willing to trust in the dependableness of God, in God's um, provision. Even if God, and we'll see this, even if God's provision comes through the people that we are sent to, uh, depend on God's provision, not on your own provision. Now, I think that in this case is literal. I think uh, in our case, it's both literal and and symbolic that is uh we work to be able to take care of ourselves so that we don't become a burden to other people but as we're going out uh, a worker as jesus says in this context is worthy of his or her hire uh, of their work so depend on god for your needs but know that god works through people 
in in this case, I would say also in in the illnesses that we're facing with our friends, um, God works through the medical profession. God works through uh, people who have studied and thought and are thinking about how best to treat some of the illnesses of our day. But in this case, God will provide food and drink and um, shelter for you, but God is going to do that through the people that you are sent to. And then what do we take? Well, we take peace. The first thing you say when you go to a house is peace be to this house. Um, this, uh, By the way, in, in the New Testament, uh, and maybe in the Old too, I haven't, um, I'd have to look at that some more, but I think in both Testaments, peace is really a gift from God. Yes, it is a cessation of hostility, but it is so much more than that when, when we say peace. Peace be to you. Um, the gift of well-being. Uh, and if there is someone there who is in tune with the message of Jesus, um, let your peace rest and stay with that person. Um, so one thing we take is peace. Another thing we take is presence, right? Um in this particular case, Jesus says, don't flit from house to house. In other words, don't go looking for a better spot. The house you go to, stay there. Whether, in fact, it is receptive and, and um, in tune with what you're saying or not, stay there. And be fed from that, uh, that community, that household. Um, Third, what they do is take healing. Um, the command uh, to healing comes uh, to those who are going, uh, and it comes to those who are in the house that you are in. If there are those who are ill or sick uh, and need to be cared for, then uh, heal them. Now, notice that the peace, the presence, and the healing all come before the message. I don't really like this. <laughs> I want to, I want the preaching to come first and then we go and do what we're supposed to do. But here you have peace. Yes, that's the gift and presence and healing. And then, you know what? Tell them why all of this is taking place. It's because the kingdom of God, the reign of God is right here at the door. It's right next to you. It's coming on you. Um, it is uh, the reign of God, which is uh, uh, the fullness of peace and presence and um, and healing. And so uh, that's what you take. Now, um, if people respond to that, then leave your peace with them. If they don't respond to that, then let it come back to you. And the 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 dust the the wiping off of the dust of the of the streets, of the city, uh, that's an that's an act of judgment. Uh, it's a symbolic way of judgment, but the judgment isn't going to come necessarily until the day of judgment. It it just says until that day, but it's the eschatological day of judgment that's coming. Um, and there will be judgment, and the judgment on those people who are hearing the good news, who are hearing the gospel, who are who have the opportunity to relate to the Messiah of God, it's going to be worse on them than it is than the judgment is on uh, the the symbol of what God is judging in terms of Sodom. And by the way, in this particular case, the judgment on Sodom is because of their inhospitality. Uh, that, that's what's going on in this particular case as well. In these cities that the disciples are going to, uh, it's their inhospitality that is being judged and their, and their um, lack of response to the good news of the gospel. Okay. Well, what I want then by conclusion, let me just uh, have a minute to conclude. I wanted to just... Uh, remind us about how the, the text of the New Testament is developed. Uh, we, by the way, we probably have a better New Testament than any of the first century uh, Christians had. 
they had one strand or another. Uh, they didn't have everything we have, not until actually the, um, you know, the uh, I think it was 487, Athanasius's Easter letter listed the seven or the 20, 27 books of the New Testament. And uh, that's when we have uh, the full New Testament as uh, as we have it today. But even then, it was not put together like ours is. Um, being a full participant in the mission of God, how does that resonate with you? Uh, being a lamb in the midst of wolves, how does that sound to you? Uh, being sent and depending on the provision of God, um, can we do that really? Or do we make our own provisions? Um it doesn't seem like there's a significant difference between the recipients who receive the peace and those who are told that they will receive judgment. In other words, it's it's the same people in the same community. Some are receptive, some are not. Um, by the way, when we pass the peace of Christ in worship, um, that's not really a check-in about how somebody's week went. That's really saying to them, the gift of God's peace is really meant for you. Receive it. Let me, let me uh, remind you of that and receive it as God's gift. And I think that's really important to remember. That's why we do that every Sunday. Um, okay. I better stop. Okay, um, please put your questions or thoughts in the chat or raise your hand. Um, Ed, uh, Ed and or Carol are wondering, is it possible that some of the 72 were married couples? Well, sure, <laughs> I'll yeah. say sure on that. Um, We know that there are married couples that are have responded to the gospel, like Priscilla and Aquila, um, and they become partners. Paul becomes a partner with them, and they do their trade, they do their work in the different places that they are. So they they are really uh, developing their own income along the way. But yes, I yes, I would say yes. We don't know, but I would say yes. Uh, let's see, Marie, uh, which cities do you imagine the disciples were sent into, Jewish only or mainly Samaritan or both? No, I think this is Samaritan. I think um, they're not in the Judea area yet. They're, they're kind of, it seems to me, on the border between the north and the, and the middle section. But this is a section that they're going through that is a Samaritan section. And I think that they're going into Samaritan villages, not, and in fact, um, what, what we have with Jesus is uh, the Samaritans didn't accept them. And so they went to a different community, but the different community was also in the Samaritan area, it seems to me. And we'll see, we'll see how good of a view Jesus has of the Samaritans as we uh, get closer to um, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Let's see, from Doug, how much context do we have for this practice? Do other groups, like the Essenes maybe, do this? Is there a practice of people welcoming religious wayfarers? Do they stop at random houses or do they go to a synagogue? How many towns have a religious gathering point? I would say all the towns have a religious gathering point. I would say that it's probably a bit more uh, parallel to like cynic philosophers uh, uh, who would go from town to town um, and teach their particular view of life um, as opposed to Jewish or Essenes. Essenes tended, I think, more to withdraw from society. So we have the Qumran community um, as opposed to going from town to town and city to city. Um, but it wasn't 
it wasn't, I mean, maybe this large of a band of people moving all at the same time, and I think it was a large band, um, is more unusual. But in terms of bands of, or in terms of people moving and uh, offering their particular uh, philosophical perspective or religious perspective, I would say it's more philosophical than religious. That, that's a hunch. We need Mike Stewart, who is no longer with us. Um, he would know more. And would anybody else, is anybody else um, a classical or Old Testament scholar that would know about that? I, I mean, I, the prophets moved, you know, sometimes from place to place. But even that, those were, I think, more settled in particular areas. Uh, yeah, Mary, Mary, go you know. ahead. Okay. Uh, you're muted, Mary. Oh, um, I just, I find this passage difficult for myself. And I'm wondering if you could take off your Bible scholar hat and put on your pastor hat. When you read, when we read this as, you know, a band of our little church here, what's like, What's your recommendation? What are you, what are your ideas for how, after studying this today, we can become better Christians, clearer Christians in the day we live now? Yeah, it it seems to me that uh, one th one thing that hits me out of the text, which I like and I don't like. Uh, about following Christ is the lamb wolf analogy. Um, I do think that the way we live in peace and vulnerability is is what will change the world. Mm -hmm. I don't think wolf mentality, especially from a religious point of view, will change the world. Mm -hmm. Now, I could be naive on that, but it seems to me that that's one thing. So what is the what is our mentality as we relate to our neighbors? Mm -hmm. Is it, I'm going to make sure they become Christian, or is it to, you know, share our, the peaceableness that we have from Christ with them, verbally or non-verbally? Um, is it that if that we're working with them, if there's an illness or there's something that we can help out? I mean, we're not going to heal them in the same way, but we may be instruments of healing, even mm -hmm. emotional. Mm -hmm. and, um, and we show them the provision of God in some of those kind of situations. So how how willing are we to put feet to our faith in that context? Mm -hmm. I don't like, I just have to say, I don't really like calling my neighbor a wolf uh, with the with the expectation that they're going to try and eat me up um, mm -hmm. and destroy me. I, I don't I don't have neighbors like that. Mm -hmm. At least not overtly. Now, there may be neighbors who, I mean, I worked for a woman, uh, she, she was the chair of the department uh, of philosophy that in one of the schools that I taught in, uh, she was uh, an, um, how would you say it? Uh, she was an overt atheist. Mm -hmm. Was she a wolf? Well, she had grown up in the church. Uh, it was quite... Um, negative in her experience um but what she wanted part of what she wanted me to do because she knew i was a pastor as well was to pastor the kids who were in my class that doesn't sound like a wolf to me mm -hmm. and so i i have to say okay what's the analogy about it's really about it seems to me about being willing to be vulnerable um, 
in the context of our life where we don't where we're not putting where we're not wolves in the sense of um, aggressive behavior towards others religiously or in any other way um, but we are uh, vulnerable and dependent on them and on God in those situations that, that would be one thing I would mm -hmm. say yeah. The other thing I would say is there is something about taking on the mentality of being a full participant in what God is doing in the world. Do we see ourselves in that light? Mm -hmm. I think if we see ourselves in that light, we will act differently. Mm -hmm. um, and it doesn't mean that we will we will have all the answers or that we will tell everybody, you know, all the message. I mean, there is something about the order in which their disciples are to carry out their ministry, you know, give the gift that God has given to you of peace and um, heal them. If, if there's any way that you can in fact, heal them, um, pray, I mean, all of these things are critically important. Mm -hmm. And I think in the way we live, not just in what we say, but in the way we live, uh, we give our witness to others. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let's see, uh, Tina uh, wants to know, do you find the no-nonsense aspect of Jesus' teachings a little scary, out of character? No, I think, I mean, I think part of what Jesus is doing is, uh, or is, is reflecting um, literarily, if you will, or uh, by way of analogy. I mean, Jesus says some really harsh things. Mm -hmm. And he says some really harsh things to the Jews. My, the way that I kind of um, embrace that is that what we have, for instance, in the Gospel of John, he calls them your father, the devil, you know, is so forth. And they say, our father is Abraham, not the devil. Um, we're listening in on a very heated family discussion. I, I think we have all said things, maybe not. I have said things in family discussions, which I wish I had not said, which were really harsh. And I, I can just say my brothers have done the same, um, where we have, uh, the parts of the family have been in tears over what we're saying about their political persuasion or their religious lack of understanding or misunderstanding from our point of view. And I think part of what's happening in scripture is that we're listening in, especially with Jesus. And I mean, he's the Jewish Messiah. He's not the Gentile Messiah. He's the Jewish Messiah for all the world. But nonetheless, he's the Jewish Messiah. And for us to listen in on that kind of uh, dialogue, I mean, I, I think is... Um, instructive for us. Uh, we had, Janie and I have friends who, um, it was a couple and they, dear, dear, wonderful people, but it's it was sometimes very hard to get to, to be around them because they would just bicker at each other, it felt like to us. To them, it wasn't bickering. That was just how they talked to each other. Um, I think when we look at someone else's family system, we have to understand the context of it. And within the Jewish tradition, there is this bantering back and forth, and then it's prayer time or it's worship time, and they sit down and they worship together. That's something that Protestants don't do very well. I just want to say that. We, we bicker, and if we don't like what our brother or sister is saying, we leave. We go somewhere else. We go to another place. That's not the Jewish tradition. And so what we're listening in on 
um, is a different way of processing and agreeing and disagreeing than is often true of us as Protestants. And we could learn a lot by listening um, uh, and understanding how that process takes place. So I would say, yes, I'm bothered a little bit by some of the things that Jesus says or that Paul says, but I think we're look, we, we need to contextualize it. And maybe it's not as harsh or as judgmental as it sounds to us uh, because of the context within which it is being said. But also it suggests, oh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. But also it suggests that there will, it will come down to well, there I think, will be yes. judgment. Um, and, you know, it's like at the bottom level of the Holocaust Museum in D.C., um, where they say you're either protectors or you were the, you know, there's all those walls that list all the people who saved mm -hmm. Jews. And then mm -hmm. you come to Denmark and it says the people of Denmark because they lost so few, because they really made a huge effort. Mm -hmm. um, and you just stand there and go, whoa, you'll either be a sheep or a goat at the end. <laughs> I don't know. It's just... Uh, well, I mean, I think that also... This is why I was in therapy for 10 years, you know, just this self kind of... Right. Never, I'll never be good enough. I'll never make it. Right, right. But I think, I think at least the monotheistic religions all are... Uh, somewhat linear mm. so we're, we're all moving towards an end where there will be final justice and judgment mm -hmm. um Kant, Immanuel Kant actually has a, a a theory where we need an afterlife in order for full justice to take place mm. and he's he's looking at that from he, he's arguing from a philosophical point of view not a religious point of view that that if 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 there's going to be full justice, there needs to be an afterlife um, in a sense where that's going to happen. Um, the, the other religions or traditions that are more circular, don't, I don't think they have this, the same kind of uh, end point uh, in the same way. But yes, th there will be some kind of uh, final judgment or justice. And I think that's good news and not bad news. Let's see, we've got quite a bit more in the chat. I'm wondering if you want to continue or maybe start with that on, um, on Tuesday. Let's start with it on Tuesday. Okay. okay. And I'm, I'm going to do, I think it's the next two things. So we have the the judgment of uh, the cities, and then we have the response of the um, of the disciples as they come back and talk to Jesus. I'm going to put those two together, um, and I'll, I'll tell Linda as we get the word out. But I'm going to look that over because I think those would fit together well. Okay, let me close this then with prayer. God, we are. Um, challenged, deeply challenged, sometimes disturbed, um, but we want to enter into your peace in a way that admits to ourselves and to you that uh, we are dependent upon you and thankful for your gifts of peace, of healing, um, of provision. We accept our life really as a gift from you, even the ability to work and make money so we can put food on the table and share it with others. Uh, that too is a gift from you. And so we're thankful for the life that we can live. We're thankful for your call uh, on our life uh, to enter into full participation in what you're doing in the world and help us to do that with joy and uh with a big embrace. And so guide us as we do so. And um, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.